All right, welcome back to Biggest Little Victory. Today we have a special guest. It'll be Allie Myers, and we're going to talk about the word redeem. Uh, this is what Pastor David covered this last Sunday, and we're just going to go over a few announcements. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our live devotionals. We have those every weekday. Actually, I think we have those uh, seven days a week. Uh, but we want to make sure that you stay connected, especially in this time when we are continuing to be isolated. We're continuing to have to stay apart. Definitely stay connected. So we have different ways to do that. We have devotionals and we have uh, other Bible studies that take place uh, throughout the week. So make sure to follow us on Facebook and uh, make sure you stay connected that way. So look for us using Victory Christian Fellowship on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube as well. We're going to be having Wednesday sermons, and we will do our best to cover those Wednesday sermons as best as we can. But again, uh, the best way to stay up to date on us is to follow us on social media. And that is all I have for announcements. Anyone else have anything? I do. Go. The biggest little victory has a Twitter now. Yes, it does. It's, <laughs> it's at BLV podcast. That's BLV podcast. Literally no one has followed it. And it's been live for a week. So I'm like, this is really encouraging, but it's brand new. And we're trying to start a segment where we really talk about small victories or big victories that our community wants to share with the world. And I think that's the best place for you guys to like tweet it to us or send it to us in a DM without us making another Facebook or another anything like that. It's just a new platform. So um, give it a shot. If it doesn't work, then I'll move on. But um, give us a follow on there if you are, if you tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fairly new to Twitter. I have one from years ago, but this is way beyond my I have no idea what I'm even doing, but I'm giving it a shot. So. <laughs> Give us a follow on there if you if you tweet. All right, and I think that covers it. So we're gonna get we're gonna come back, and the passage this week is from Ruth chapter four, and he did read pretty much all the way down to the bottom. Now he did skip around a little bit and go in depth on some of the areas. So we won't do the entire chapter, just kind of the area that he was focusing in on, and we'll go from there. All right, so we are in Ruth chapter 4. You can follow along with us. I'll be reading out of the New Century version, so if you have something different, then you'll probably get something a little bit different out of this, and that's okay too. So we're going to start with verse 1. Boaz went to the city gate and sat there until the close relative he had mentioned passed by. Boaz called to him, Come here, friend, and sit down. So the man came over and sat down. Boaz gathered ten of the elders of the city and told them, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then Boaz said to a close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, wants to sell the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I decided to tell you about it. If you want to buy back the land, then buy it in front of the people who are sitting here and in front of the elders of my people. But if you don't want to buy it, tell me because you are the only one who can buy it, and I am next after you. The close relative answered, I will buy back the land. Then Boaz explained, When you buy the land from Naomi, you must also marry Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's wife. That way the land will stay in the dead man's name. The close relative answered, I can't buy back the land. If I did, I might harm what I pass on to my own sons. I cannot buy the land back, so buy it yourself. Long ago in Israel, when people traded or bought something, one person took off his sandal and gave it to the other person. This was the proof of ownership in Israel. So the close relative said to Boaz, Buy the land yourself. And he took off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, You are witnesses today. I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech and Kilian and Malon. I am also taking Ruth, the Moabite, who is the wife of Malon, and as my wife. I am doing this so her dead husband's property will stain his name, and his name will not be separated from his family and his hometown. So you are witnesses today. So, any thoughts on that so far? Ali, you there? 
Oh, yes, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> So kind of, so you got a chance to look, re, go over the sermon. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I watched watched the sermon earlier, um, and I kind of this is um, it's an interesting passage. I think that my first initial response was like, "Wow, I'm super glad to not live in a time period where women can be." <laughs> bought as wives um With a that was like my, my first like wow um but it is it is like an interesting concept to have in ancient israel of this like redeeming families who have like lost you know the men who could carry on the family name and whatever um and it just was super interesting to hear how david kind of connected that to the sort of redemption story that we have in christ um it's cool to kind of see those connections. Like we get a lot of that in like the New Testament, but it's really cool to see that in the Old Testament too. Definitely. Yeah. It, there's so many different rituals and different things that they did in the Old Testament that sometimes are really hard to understand until you break it down. So kind of like this, if I had read this passage about like giving a sandal for selling property, <laughs> that kind of a thing, I would have just been I've just been really confused. So it's actually rare that this one actually explains exactly why they did that. But most of the time you're just kind of left to figure it out yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're separated by so much like time and culture and language. A lot of times you're reading the Bible, you're like, what is even going on? Um, <laughs> I'm very thankful for all those people who do the hard work of like translation and like cultural history research on all of that because yeah it's like a lot of things um but yeah so with this one so he focused on the redeem part and so the version that i read this in the new century i don't think it uses the word redeem it just says close relative but in a more what would be the word more fanciful language or version it says kinsman redeemer but this version kind of cuts that out. So he wanted to focus on the word redeem and talking about how we are redeemed, especially through Christ. So Naomi, excuse me, Ruth was redeemed with Boaz accepting her as, uh, as his wife. And as such, she actually got to be part of the, the family line for King David. And we are redeemed into God's family through Jesus. And that was kind of his focus from that. And I really liked how he connected the two together. Yeah, I I do um, too. Like I said, like it's it's super cool to see those like connections um, in the in the Old Testament um, that kind of go along with um, like what we have in the New Testament with Jesus and stuff. Um, and it's also really cool to see that more from the perspective of like like a woman uh, main character, I guess. Like this book is like named after Ruth, and to see that like through kind of her circumstances um and so I think you get like like even more similarities of like when you talk about like the you know the bride of Christ like the church is the bride of Christ like you get a lot of like female imagery with that and so it's kind of cool to even see those connections too through it um and just even seeing like in this in this culture where women weren't super valued like to have a story about a woman and have it be so positive and uplifting it's really cool to see that yeah, so um, yeah what, what do you think about the entire book of Ruth just coming from your perspective um I've always kind of liked Ruth I mean I think like growing up there's a lot of stuff and it's like what is going on um but the overall <laughs> like the scandals and the like I mean it took me a really long time before I understood what, like what a kinsman redeemer is um just because that's so like different from from the world that we live in um, right um but like i think the overall like story of ruth is really uplifting because it's this it's this woman who's you know an outcast and she doesn't belong and you know she's got like nothing but her mother-in-law like they're just down and out um and to see this beautiful story of like they get redeemed they get new life they get to like restore um their family and have hope again um and I just 
you know, I love the parallels because like Jesus, a lot of times throughout so many stories in the Testament, he's like going to the outcast and he's going to the people who society doesn't care about or doesn't believe he's worth anything or, you know, the people that society like claims that like they're stuck in sin, like we can't touch them, we can't be around them. Um, and Jesus is continually going to those people and he uses them to do things that are so much more powerful than anything we could ever imagine, you know? And so I love this, this story of this woman who just didn't belong, like didn't belong in Israel, um, being redeemed. And then through that, like so much good comes of that, right? Because then eventually you get like um, David, right? And so like, it's just, I love those stories where it's like, you know, the outcast comes it's new life through through God and through Jesus and it just I think it gives a lot of hope in these times because it's like we're never going to be too far from that redeeming power of God right like you can't be so outcast or so far beyond that like he shows us repeatedly that like it doesn't matter how far you think you are outside of what you should be like God can redeem anything kind of a thing so I think it's just a super good book that's, you know, very hopeful and just, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, <laughs> I love that, that it's, there's so much redemption. There's so much of God's power throughout the book. And definitely, like you said, being a book that champions women in a time when women weren't typically championed, especially when you yeah. think about many of the famous women characters of the Bible. There were, there were quite a few when you actually start to dig into it, but Obviously, when you're looking at the surface, you see Ruth, you see Esther, and those are the only two books that are named after women. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's like that's just really cool to see God moving not only in a woman, but even in a woman who was not an Israelite. She was a complete outsider. Yeah, um, and it's really, I mean, you know, um, you know, she was a Moabite. Like that wasn't that wasn't exactly chill you know like <laughs> people are just like, oh, like oh that's like a moabite like like no that's like a big deal i mean that's like you walk in and people like give you the side eye like what are you doing here um and so like not only like she was, like she was a moabite like and god chose to work through her like so yeah i think, I think it's good yeah i was gonna say i think that speaks a lot to how god tends to use the smaller and the lesser thans to make a big point instead of finding the king, finding the emperor, finding the general to tell his stories. He tends to find the people that most everyone in, in that society would overlook. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, you know, I love that. I think it's sort of challenging for myself too, to be like, who, who am I overlooking that like, maybe God wants to work through like you know um because I think it is it's super easy to get like caught up in our own worlds and our own like status quo and it's, I think it's kind of this challenge of like don't overlook anybody right. um because you never know who God's gonna work through and it is like I think it's amazing a lot of stories in the Bible are um you know the outcasts and the people who who don't fit in and who don't really have a place in society and like through those people, like, it's almost like God is able to do more through them than you could ever imagine, right? Like, than you could ever think possible. Um, and I just think it's, like, that's really cool. It's like, just a reminder, like, just don't, don't count anybody out. Don't discount, you know, the gifts that God has given them and what they are capable of for the kingdom. Because um, I think everyone's important. Everyone has a gift and um, some calling from God that they can live into. And I think if we, you know, raise people up and give them the tools they need to accomplish that. Like it can be really amazing to watch God work through people. Especially people that we don't think have anything to offer. Yeah. Yeah. Or even so. people that we might write off in the beginning. Uh, I think that we have a lot of examples in the church of people who started out kind of against the Bible, against God, and they kind of show up just curious. What's this all about? And they end up becoming really strong leaders in the church. No one would have thought that starting out. They might have just thought of them as a problem, a nuisance, somebody that just needed to be quiet and listen. And now they've become a huge influence to their community. 
I mean, I think probably the most most well known is probably Paul. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Literally, like persecuting persecuting Christians and turned into like one of the major voices, even still to this day, that we like take as an authority on like on the gospels. Man, the redeeming power of God is just nothing like it. Um, <laughs> it's <just> amazing thing. <laughs> I, I like that. I think actually there's a lot of people that quote Paul more than Jesus. That's surprising. There's there's a lot, I feel like a lot more words written by Paul than Jesus. Just because so. he wrote the actual letters, but yeah. But I also think it's like you get kind of like the stories of Jesus and Paul's more like interpreting them. And so I think it's kind of easier to like take what Paul's saying because that's like a little bit of like what do we do post Jesus sort of thing? That's sorry, side note, but like <laughs> No, that's good. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you talk, you think about how Jesus spoke to people and it was in parables. So a lot of times Jesus wasn't speaking in plain language. And yeah. there were times that he didn't explain the parables and we're left to kind of figure out and pick up the pieces. Whereas Paul kind of does that for us and dissects that information in a way that we can just understand. Which I, which I think is helpful because, I mean, when you are... I think one of the things that like was great about Jesus is he used a lot of, well, I think it would have been plain language for a lot of people at the times, like using a lot of like imagery and stuff that's really familiar to the people he's talking to. But like, I'm not like a farmer or a shepherd. So when you start talking about sheep, like I don't know anything <laughs> about sheep. So, like, you mean not, you like, can't relate to that? Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not super relating to the sheep herders. Like it's not an experience <laughs> that I have, um, but yeah. <laughs> So it's helpful to have that like voice of like interpreting it a little bit for us. No, I completely agree. And I just wanted to share this one passage. So previous podcast, I had talked about it briefly, but I really want to share this because it's such good word. Like it's good word. It is very, it is a very beautiful speech that Ruth gave when Naomi was trying to keep her from following her back to Israel. And Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. Just the level of determination in somebody like Ruth to have that kind of attitude about following this brand new mother-in-law back to a strange land and a strange God is an incredible. It is it's also interesting because I like, it seems to me kind of like if she hadn't done that, like neither one of them would have gotten that redemption story at the end, right? Like if she hadn't gone back with Naomi, she probably would have gone back to her parents and, you know, maybe that turned into something else for her. But like, you know, Naomi, Naomi going back you know, I don't know that Naomi would have been able to work in the fields or like do that stuff. So it's interesting that like that level of devotion, like kind of led them into this redemption story of, you know, banding together and getting through hard times together. I mean, David's been going on about um, embracing suffering together. And I mean, man, if that's not embracing suffering together, I don't know what is. So it's cool to see it's like, like that had to be a, a hard choice, like to leave the, your homeland and go to a strange land with someone who's not even your blood relative, like that you've married into that family. Like that'd be a super hard choice, but like that level of determination and like sacrifice and like love for another person. It's just amazing to see like what that turned into through those hard choices and through those hard circumstances and suffering together and just seeing how God was able to, to take that and redeem it and turn it into something new and to give them hope again. It's, it's really amazing that what God can take from people that we think are kind of a lost cause. And in Naomi's, so it's interesting that if Naomi had been really firm, so even if Ruth had said all that and Naomi still said, no, you're not going to come with me and that's final. And maybe just left in the dark of night or something and went back to Israel by herself. It's kind of like what you said, what would she have done? She's older. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have children who can work for her. Where would she have done to provide for herself? So in reluctantly bringing Ruth along, maybe she didn't know, well, what are you even going to do with me? 
what are we going to be able to do together to survive in Israel coming back with me? And so her entire mindset was around this idea that there wasn't anything that was going to happen or anything beneficial that was going to happen with the two of them going back to Israel. And turns out Ruth can actually provide for her and be there for her. And now they have Boaz and all of this came about because Naomi allowed Ruth to come back. I think it's hard. I think we all kind of, I don't know, at least most people that I know struggle with like accepting help and accepting like other people I guess burdening themselves to help us like that's a really hard position to be in like to accept help or to accept um like I can't imagine I can't imagine like somebody leaving everything they know to like go with me somewhere like that's you know that that didn't have to like that's that's crazy like it's a huge sacrifice so it is it's important that she did she like let that happen like oh you know allowed Ruth to make that choice for herself um, to come with her and and to you know be like well whatever happens like we'll get through it together we'll do this we'll do life together from here you know yeah well and it's it's amazing to have that humility because kind of what you talk about that pride of not yeah. wanting to accept help from somebody else and being able to let that go and say you know what I can let this person help me it's not an insult it's not something that's against my character. I just need help. That's the best part about being part of a church, especially a church like BCF. Is, that yeah. I, I, I have, I have yet to see somebody deny the help for, that is being offered to them. And I think that's, I mean, that, like the way I just said that made them sound greedy, but that's not <laughs> what I meant. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's a family, like, Right, we're exactly. all struggling. We're all imperfect. We all need help from time to time, and so it's like, I feel like it's easier to accept help from family because you know they're, they're doing it out of love. They're not doing it out of like obligation or pity or any of that stuff. Like it really is just like, hey, I love you. Let me help. Right. At right. least for me, that's like it's much easier to accept help in that regard than. I mean, even, even something as simple as letting a person with less items than you cut in front and cut in front in line, like a couple days ago. Dustin and I were at the grocery store and we all know how crazy grocery stores are right now. And <laughs> what do you mean? They're walking the park. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was a, she wasn't like super elderly, but you could tell she was older and um, she only had like five things, but she didn't grab a basket. So she was kind of like balancing them in her arms and we had gone grocery shopping. So we had the belt full and Dustin was like, you want to get in front of us? And she's like, no, no, that's okay. And we're like, no, <laughs> get in front of No, us. seriously. <laughs> like, like, we really, really, really just should get in front of us. <laughs> and we just, we had, we had to like kind of force her, you know, we weren't like forcing if she would have just been like, no, it's really okay. Leave me alone. We would have been like, okay, fine. <laughs> but, you know, she she eventually was just like thank you so much you know and you can tell that it was, she just kind of like relaxed a little bit just from the kindness of it you know so it's but it, I mean just something as simple as that and I'm the same way if I were in that lady's spot I've been like no it's fine it's fine you know but it just reminded me of that sorry it was my little anecdote no I like that <laughs> I, I think that it, it speaks a lot to uh, the VCF family and the kind of culture that we've cultivated in the church, that we have a, an environment where it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to accept help, and no one's going to make you feel less than for doing so. Right, right. And the best part about it is that we offer it before it's asked for also. That's it. You yeah. know, so that's also a, a wonderful, wonderful thing that I've, I've just seen. I've seen it in all the local churches because I follow all of them on Facebook everybody is just coming together as a church community and doing their part, you know, saying like, I'm healthy, I can go out. I'm not in the, you know, red zone of this virus. I can do this for you. And people are taking it because they know that their lives are on the line. And we had this conversation last week, Stephen, where we were talking about what was going to happen to the church from this, you know? Mm -hmm. and I remember you telling me that was a little bit too pessimistic. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> It wasn't, I never used the word pessimistic. That's I used true. the word, I used the word ominous. There's a difference. <laughs> <Downer>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so if you haven't listened to last week's podcast, <laughs> definitely go check that out. No, I, we were. <laughs> so, but I think, I think that, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, say I told you so, but right now it's looking really great for the church, the way that we're reacting to this, even the capital C church, at least the Reno capital C church. I don't know about the world, but the Reno capital C church is, is killing it in the giving game. Let me tell you, I'm Absolutely. very, very proud of our, I'm very proud of our city right now. I'm even just amazed by how much, even people who are susceptible in what they're willing to give and what they're willing to contribute. Right. Right. I mean, we're all, I mean, Stephen, you just hit 30, but <laughs> you know, like, yep. we're all I mean I don't know how old you are Ali but I think you're younger than I am actually I'm 24 yeah so I'm 28 so we're all young you know we're, right <laughs> we're all young and so if we got it you know I'm not saying we won't succumb but it's a lot less likely for us to because we're all healthy young adults right so it's it's very very important that you know one if you are going out and about, it's hard to not be in contact with your elderly family, you know, and, but you can always drop off groceries on their doorstep, you know? So this has turned into a conversation that is not at all about Ruth, but it, it kind of, it kind of, you know, <laughs> I think you know, that kind of happens. <laughs> right. That, that always happens, but you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's relevant to, today's current climate so I, at least we're in that arena <laughs> <laughs> well if you want the plug back into ruth uh, we can easily go into the the amount of generosity that boaz had for ruth when she came to work for him she could have just been yet another one of the workers in the field but he insistently instructed his workers to make sure that she got extra food make sure that they left her the best spots to go glean and even told the men to, you know, give her extra, give her extra food, give her extra space to do her thing and leave her alone and all that kind of stuff. So he, he was incredibly generous to her for nothing other than the fact that she just came to his field. He didn't know who she was. He didn't know that her story, someone else told him about her, but she was just this woman who came into the field. And he decided, oh, yeah, let's do everything for her. Let's just make this super easy for her. Let's make her go home with an abundance of food, way more than she could ever need. I love this sort of, like, idea in the Old Testament of, like, you don't pick everything out of your field. Because, like, what if, you know, somebody comes along and they need it? Like, you don't, you don't completely, like, milk every ounce of profit that you can out of, like, what you have because you have like some responsibility to help those that are like less fortunate than you. Um, but even like with that, I think Boaz even goes like further than he had to, because even just letting her, you know, pick up the extras and the fields or whatever was like probably fulfilling his duty, but he does like go above and beyond that of like adding this extra layer of protection around her of like, you know, and so it's, it's, it's cool to see that happening too. I didn't think about that. That's really cool. It's just that intentionality of leaving something else for other people rather than just all for yourself and then maybe I'll share out of my abundance or share out of what I've made. But and to intentionally say, well, someone might come along, so I'm just going to go ahead and leave this there for them. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's like, I don't know how like well it was maybe followed all the time, but that was like, <laughs> you know, it's like an intention of like, hey, like we leave something there for people who don't have you know what they need like leave a little bit behind um and I think that's I mean I think that's something that we can think about too it's like out of everything that I have like am I able to like make space in that to like give to people who have less than me um and that could be in a lot of things you know it could be money it could be time it could be our our resources or like you know volunteering or you know there's a bunch of ways we can do that but um I think even just giving just like a little bit out of what you have can be so impactful, especially for someone who really needs that. And then, you know, especially if, you know, if you're able to going above and beyond that is, I mean, it just can really, really impact somebody's life who really needs it. Yeah. Share the toilet paper. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> like the they're not. They're not accepting or something. There you go. <laughs> they're not accepting returns on that stuff. So <laughs> you got to do something with it. All you have to <laughs> pay for orders is leave some on planters in the middle of downtown. <laughs> I only used half a package. I'd like to give this back. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I've had to steal some from work. Oh, I had really? To, I, had to, I had to go to my boss and be like, I have to steal toilet paper. Is that okay? <laughs> it was so pathetic, you know, but at the same time, it was very humbling. So I'm like, I cannot find toilet paper for some reason. No, it's gone. And that is, it is so strange. And I know that that is most of the world. And if you have toilet paper, good for you. Hopefully you just have an acceptable amount. <laughs> but I am like struggling to find toilet paper. So I had to go to my boss and ask her if I could take toilet paper from work. And thankfully she said yes, but it's like, I don't pay for those. My boss doesn't even pay for those. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> so it's, it's, it, it's, an, it's incredible, you know? So yes, the idea of being able to give something more than, what you have like I have more cans of soup in my kitchen than I even need for a household of two people so if anybody would like some soup hit a sister <laughs> up because I need to get rid of some soup so, <laughs> <laughs> you know so but that's what I that's what I have to offer so I, I really I, I really like your like your where your head's at Allie thanks <laughs> <laughs> but seriously you need soup hit me up <laughs> I was about to ask you when you said that you had to steal from work. I was like, does your boss listen to this podcast? Because she might have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, luckily she's a she's a very very dear friend as well as my boss, so we have that rapport. So it was I'm a little bit more fortunate than some people, but anyway, <laughs> she she's aware that I did take toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's <a> good. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share, and either of you two can join in or not, um, just about what it meant to me to be uh, redeemed both personally, and then we can talk about just kind of what that means for the church and what that means to be redeemed through Christ. But for myself, what that meant to be on the receiving end of just extreme generosity and to have somebody do a lot of work in order to, I don't know, uh, keep me afloat, to keep me afloat both spiritually as well as physically. Just, first of all, I had that somewhat of a pride issue where I'm saying, no, I'm okay, I can do this myself, I can figure this out. But it took a, it took a, me stepping back and saying, okay, no, I need to, I do not be so prideful because I do need help. And this person isn't doing so because they're going to make me feel guilty or because they're going to hound me every single day saying, hey, remember how I did this for you? So where's my payback? I didn't have to worry about that. I was going to be treated very lovingly. And so in receiving all the help that I got and all the uplifting and encouragement through a lot of really dark times, I was able to not only stay afloat, but actually thrive spiritually at a time when I was in serious trouble. And for me, that just was something so so unbelievably powerful to go through. And so looking through this story and thinking about with Ruth and Naomi to be redeemed, to have Boaz there to rescue them from a life of uncertainty, not knowing where the next meal was going to come from, not knowing how they were going to pay for everything and to suddenly just be cared for. That kind of feeling for me was overpowering and really, really humbling, but also it made me really grateful. And the first thing that I wanted to do was when I got back on my feet, I wanted to be there for other people. I wanted to share that. I wanted to be the, that person for someone else, to be the redeemer for someone else. So that's just kind of what my story was. Thanks for sharing, Steven. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was that's awesome, Steven. I'm glad that you have something like that and someone like that because we all need someone like that on different levels of extreme extreme but I I think it's extremely important to have somebody that you can turn to especially in you know 
our hearts where we really need that spiritual guidance every now and then, you know? So I think it's awesome that you have somebody that you can go to that for. Well, it's actually been multiple people. It's been more than one person, but it's been uh, just a, a community effort of support that I could not have, I could not have gotten myself back to where I am now without them. And I mean, definitely the two of you are a part of that community, but it's a, it's a big community that has just been so wonderful that I'm incredibly grateful for. Good. I know there's like so many people in, in like VCF and in that like surrounding community that just like, they, they do a really good job of like keeping Mm -hmm. you afloat when you wouldn't be able to make it by yourself. Like just uh, you know, when we're having a bad day or just really struggling, just to be able to reach out to somebody and be like, hey, like today just sucks. Um, mm-hmm. And to have somebody to like help you carry the weight of that, it's just it's really amazing. And I think that's one thing that, that BCF does really, really well. Yes. Uh, to like help help each other carry the burden of, of just the hardships that come along. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. We're awesome. We're tooting our own horn so much. <laughs> Everyone should just come be a part of VCF. <laughs> right, we're like, we'll we let promise you. we're not trying to send you subliminal messages. We're just really proud of our. We're just really proud of our community. <laughs> if you listen closely to the music at the end, that actually says VCF. Yeah, it just chants. It's all. It just chants. VCF. VCF. Oh gosh, no, we're not those types of Christians. <laughs> oh geez. All right. Well, do you guys have anything else to add? I think that's it on my end. That's all I had for yeah. my notes. Was yeah, just, did. yeah. So it was just kind of that last part of what that means for people who are yeah, either new believers or coming back to God and what that means to be redeemed for them. And just the importance of not trying to do life alone. Jesus is there. Jesus is there for you, and he doesn't want you to do life alone. Hence the church. He has given you people intentionally to help you not live alone. And that doesn't always mean that your life sucks or things are going terribly. It can just mean that God just wants you to be with people. He just wants you to pray with people. He just wants you to love each other because he wants you to reflect the love that he gives to you every single day. Yes, absolutely. And to kind of piggyback onto that, you know, as, as God's people, we have the unique opportunity to know his will and to live under his umbrella. And when I say God's people, I mean, everybody, um, these are times in our lives when a a storm has hit and it's hit the entire world in these times where we can either seek his will and trust him, or we can rely on our under, our own understanding and do what we think is best. At the end of the day, you have to just, uh, you have to believe that God's plan is way better than our own. And so my encouragement to you is to trust that God is at work, know that his plan is in motion and that you are in his sight. He has not forgotten about you and nothing could make him stop loving you. Um, if you're struggling or feel alone, don't be afraid to reach out to the godly people you are surrounded by. Um, BCF, BCF, (laughs) 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 you know, and, you know, back to, back to Ruth, when Ruth returned home to Naomi, she had more food than she ever imagined that she would return with. So just like Ruth, you may be looking for scraps of hope or healing, but God wants to give you so much more and you must always believe that God will provide for you more than you could ever imagine. Just like Ruth did. Um, we must operate in faith when hope seems lost and that God is still working on his beautiful tapestry and it's just a work in progress. Like we all are. So you have to, you have to lean on people. And if I'm not saying that Ruth leaned on Boaz, but, she relied on something of Boaz's to get what she needed. And at the end of the day, he, he gave her something that she couldn't even imagine. So you just have to keep remembering that you are not alone. We all feel alone, but we are not. 
and it's kind of like um, our word renew, where we're constantly being renewed. We have to constantly be reminded that we are redeemed and that we are, we are loved, we are important, and that just because it's hard right now, it's not going to be hard later. And I think it's just, we have to grip onto that and I'm struggling with it myself. And I, 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 I have to go to work every day. I'm considered essential. So I'm still struggling, even though I still have that to hang on to, um, just in my headspace and things like that. So I know it's hard, but never, ever feel alone because you're not. And that's my mic drop. That is so beautiful. <laughs> 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 wow, I don't have it's anything good. else. We don't have anything else. That was it. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, because I, I think it's really important. Because I know that you know it's it's really hard not to hug people. It's really hard not to, you know, I went and saw Bridget and Darren the other day, and it was just really hard not to give them a hug. You know, you guys know the story about Bridget and Darren. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just it's so hard, so hard that. I can't give my friend who is potentially dying a hug, <laughs> you know, and that's all I want to do. And that's like one of the biggest struggles that I have to deal with right now. And I'm throwing myself a pity party and I don't mean to be, but you know, I'm just, when pe- when you think about how bad life is, just think about, you know what, this isn't permanent. It's not permanent. <laughs> well, I've you can't that to yourself. Though. Like God, you, I can't even get a redemption story out of this mess that's going on. Like yes, I feel like nothing's because, beyond that that redeeming power. So yes, the world has an opportunity here that it needs to grasp and hold on to and do. <laughs> so we'll see. I pray that it happens every day. I pray that there is a cure soon. I pray for the world. The world is bonkers right now. Yeah, no kidding. Well, if that's it, kitties, I think we're we're good to go. All right. Well, Allie, we want to thank you for being on here. We'll definitely love to have you on again. Uh, yes, yeah, thank so you so much. Yeah. For being we are, our it's so... guest. <laughs> <laughs> it's so special. <laughs> it's awesome. And hopefully, hopefully it helps people realize that, hey come on it's pretty cool to share this stuff with us so yeah come hang out uh, with these people and talk about Jesus. yes and then you know right now it's virtual but eventually we'll all hang out you know <laughs> drink some coffee and have this chit chat face to face but right now it's still just as fun so <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely all right well if uh if we're still doing virtual next week, which of course we are, I don't know why I just said that. Um, <laughs> it might be over know, maybe, my next week. You never know. No, no, it's already been, it's already been ex- extended to April thirtieth. <laughs> right. <laughs> Love y'all, but don't come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll be we'll be back next week, uh, same time, same place. Maybe Allie, maybe someone else. You never know. Um, but we, we look forward to continuing this journey together. And if you have a little victory, big or small, big or little that you want to share with us, the Twitter and what is that, uh, URL again, it's the BLV at BLV podcast at BLV podcast that is on Twitter. So if you have a victory that you want to share a story in your life or one that you know of that is uplifting in this time of just really troubling news please share it with us we'd love to be able to feature it we want to create this segment or even an entire episode separate from what we do currently to just celebrate the good that has happened in the world so if you have anything like that please share it with us either on that twitter or you can send it to me steven at vcfreno.org so either way whichever one works best for you or over facebook or over Facebook. So we have a lot of different options. <laughs> and yep. definitely ch- ch- check out our other options as well. Uh, make sure to tune in to our devotionals, to our Bible studies. Stay connected. 
virtually, of course, but stay connected. Don't be isolated. Don't go through all of this alone. And if you need soup, please let Kendra <laughs> know. <laughs> I have a ton of soup. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody. Well, we'll see you next week. And I realized now that I just I just now realized I did not introduce myself at all at the beginning of this whole thing. I am so I'm sorry. Bad we at know this. who you are. Everybody knows who you everybody are. Everybody should tell know by this the, point. the silky softness of your voice. <laughs> 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 well, we are biggest little victory, and we will look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Prayers and love, everybody. 